This program is a production of KTCA-TV, Channel 2. Think back over all the years you've ever been involved in football, all the way back to when you were a kid. What is the single moment in football that gives you the best feeling you've ever had? You know, there have been so many I might be difficult to do, but I can tell you what gave me the worst feeling. The worst feeling was I was in the fifth grade and I was playing with the eighth grade football team. And we were playing a game and I turned down a tackle completely in front of some friends and family. And I mean, I just out and out turned into a coward. And I'll never forget the humiliation, the embarrassment, and the ridicule that I experienced for the next week after that from my teammates, so to speak, because the first time I had a chance to be a football player and I turned it down. But it made a very strong impact upon me because I think that sometimes in life we've got to do things that we don't genuinely like to do. But if we benefit from a bad experience and analyze it, it can turn out to be the most positive thing that's ever happened. There you have an American ethic expressed by one of the most successful college football coaches in the country. This is a program about the values of people trying to change a big-time college football team from a loser into a winner. It's not about kickoffs and tackles or passes and fumbles. It's about people, them and you and me. I'm Gary Gilson. In April, the University of Minnesota football staff let us record for the entire month spring practice and the people involved in it. I think you'll get to know some of them very well. Let's start with a definition of college football. It comes from the coach of Alcorn State in Mississippi, a man named Marino Kassel. He puts it this way, college football. In the East, it's a cultural exercise. On the West Coast, a tourist attraction. In the South, it's a religion. And in the Midwest, in the Midwest, college football is cannibalism. Cannibalism? Well, if you consider that 100 members of the same team, Minnesota, divide into two squads each spring, meet on the field of combat and try to devour each other, cannibalism comes pretty close. Minnesota, hats off to thee. That's the way the song goes, but for many years now, it's been anything but hats off to the Gopher football team. The old tradition of winning Big Ten and national championships crumbled into consistent, sometimes overwhelming losses. First kickoff return. Rack him. First kickoff return. Rack him up. This is the dramatic close to 20 days of grueling practice designed to mold the team for the Big Ten season. Two squads of Gopher varsity players are meeting in the annual spring game. Well, almost annual. Two years ago, they couldn't even field two teams. But football at Minnesota is changing. And this program will look beneath those changes, introduce you to the young men who are so anonymous under those helmets, introduce you to their coaches and their boosters. You'll find out why they love football, what they sacrifice to succeed at it, what they want in their lives, why they think football has a lot to do with their getting it. This is a program about what it takes to win. It is a mirror of America. Let's look into it. The flame of tradition at Minnesota was kindled by Bierman and Nagurski, Namalini and Smith, Wilkinson and Grant, Warmoth and Geel, Stevens and Bell. The last keeper of the flame was a reserve quarterback who became head coach, Joe Salem, a member of the last national championship team. Against Nebraska in 1983, the flame went out, and Salem went with it. It was time for a new keeper, one who could supply his own flame.
Who better to conduct the Minnesota Orchestra for its symphony ball kickoff than a football coach, especially a super salesman like Lou Holtz? The truth is there probably is no one like Lou Holtz. The question is, will he do at the University of Minnesota what he has done everywhere else he has coached? Here is the Holtz record. At the College of William and Mary, three years, one bowl game. At North Carolina State, four years, four bowl games. And at Arkansas, seven years, six bowl games. You don't win by accident. You win because you believe you know how to win. I'm going to guarantee you right now. We can whip anybody in the country. If we play intelligent, hard-nosed football, and the closer they get here, you get fanatical. To produce results like those here, he has to recruit players who can compete with the best in the Big Ten. No one knows yet how the higher academic standards that will apply starting next year will affect recruiting, but big-time programs face troublesome challenges. More on that later. Let's look at the challenge of football first. At the beginning, you're not used to that. And, and geez, I'm getting yelled at and I'm getting embarrassed in front of these guys. But uh, after a while, you, you get very accustomed to it. And um, that's, I mean, that's what they have to do because what they're trying to do is make you better. I mean, that's all for you. The yelling's for you. The problem is if they don't yell at you. I mean, if, if provided, I mean, unless you're like an All-American or something like that and don't make a mistake, you know, if they don't spend a lot of time with you, they probably something wrong. But if they yell at you, they're concerned about you and they know that you can do the job and uh, that, you know, that you can do it better. Because that correction right there is so much more valuable than the next day on the film. Because by the time you see him next day, he's maybe had a date, he's had a test that he studied for, he's had two other, three other classes, his uh, mom and dad called, said they were coming up, and that one little move uh, is the furthest thing from his mind. And, uh, you know, that intensity, I think, is what uh, separates him from a lot of other coaches. You're backed up inside our third. <coughs> Somebody's going in, that's a war zone. Boy, and I want to tell you, it's flat out war. And that's why you push them, that's why you drive them, that's why you work with them, so that they can enjoy success. I will never have a young man sit in our locker room ever again and cry because he failed to execute something during the course of the game, which was in the long run my fault because we didn't adequately prepare him. Hey, man. Look over here, over here. You just do what I ask you to do, don't coach. That's it, man. That's it, man. An individual is going to perform in front of 62,500 people at home. And if we have any dreams and hopes and aspirations of being one of the better football teams in the country, then that young man is going to know what pressure is all about when he gets there. We will put a lot of pressure on our athletes during the course of practice so that when they get in the game, they're completely immune to pressure. I've had athletes say to me, well, Coach, I get nervous when you're around. And I just call me and say to him, well, son, I plan on being at all the games. So you're going to have to get used to it. 
you're so restricted. I mean, you, that's what you do is you play football. But uh, the benefits I think you get out of it are, are uh, you know, are just super. I mean, you know, like I said, the camaraderie and the business people you meet and just the satisfaction you get out of playing it, uh, you know, is, is much more than having not playing football and, you know, doing something else. I'd rather have this. It's a good challenge. You really test yourself. I just kind of wish sometimes that a lot of college students could go through spring practice. Uh, with the pressures of uh, the field, the classroom, the emotional roller coaster that you're on because you had a good practice or you had a poor practice, whatever it may be, would be truly a great learning experience for a lot of a lot of people. But it's obvious that they have to pay a terrific price. Terrific price. I, I don't think there's any question. They go out and they work every day, and the kids have great worth, work ethic, and they have to put a lot into it. What what they're asked to do is to be a physical person every single time the football snap. They have to be a physical person. Get those toes pointed up the field. Do it again, John. Give me the next group up. Just the center in there. Turn those ankles out, John. Get up on them toes. First lesson right now. You'll love it and how you'll love it. Here is the drag. See how it goes. Down on your heels, up on your toes. That's the way to do the varsity drag. Fewer than new, meaner than mean, bluer than blue, gets as much applause as waving the flag. Can pass many a class, whether you're dumb or wise. If you all answer the call when your professor cries, everybody down on the heels, up on the toes, stay after school, learn how it goes. Everybody do the varsity drag. Here is the drag. Here is the drag. See how it goes. See how it goes. Down on your heels. Down on your heels. Up on your toes. Up on your toes. That's the way to do the varsity drag. Hotter than hot. Hotter than hot. Newer than new. Newer than new. Meaner than mean. Meaner than mean. Bluer than blue. Oh, yeah. Bluer than blue. Gets as much applause as made the flag. Come on, Joe. The price is a lot of time, your body. I hurt quite a bit from all, you know, the practices take a toll. Jesus, and in pre-fall we lived on aspirin just about every day. I mean, we'd take a couple aspirin before practice because our head would ring so hard from, you know, constantly hitting somebody. But uh, after a while you get, you know, as I say, you, you learn that and you get used to it and it's not bad. And that's what I, that's what I love about the games. You know, I just can't wait to get out there and, and you know, wait for that running back to come. That's fun, that's fun. When I was a sophomore, I was playing and and I uh, took a hit to the chest, and I had a, my lung collapse on me. And at that time, I was in the hospital with this tube stuck in me. I said, there's no way I'm ever going to play again. But then you start thinking, boy, I kind of, you know, something's missing, you know. This time I was in the hospital was three weeks, and then time it took to recover after that, which was another three months, just kind of missed it, and you just you learned it, boy. It's not that bad. It's a lot of work, but when you get away from it, you really think it's not that bad. I do love football. It's it's a good sport, and and it, if it doesn't teach you anything else, it teaches you how to be you know disciplined with yourself. I had heard spring practice was tough, which I didn't, I didn't really believe it, but it was. Um, we was out there for hours. I know each day, and everybody just you know worked harder and harder every day. And I know that'll be and that'll continue on into the fall to make us a better team. How does that affect the energy you have for the other things you have to do in your life? Uh, it's a big effect on it because after practice, the only thing we go to eat at the training table, and then you really don't feel like studying. I guess you would take a nap in between and then build up a little bit of injury, energy to study the rest of the night. I'm trying to be a doctor, and, uh, and the course load that I take is really demanding. So I've 
I put a lot of hours here. I'm here from, you know, I get here at 1 o'clock and, you know, to dinner and after dinner, that's 7.30. So we're talking six and a half hours a day, sometimes seven. Plus, that's not including sometimes at night we have meetings or in the morning before or in between classes we have meetings. Then after that, you know, I, I have to study and sometimes I'm up to 3 o'clock at night studying. That's what it's going to take to win, though, or to get to a Rose Bowl, I think, you know, is all that the time. It, it gets a little uh, overwhelming, you know, while, you know, day after day after day of uh, going to practice. And, you know, it never seems like you have any time. You know, you cherish an hour off. An hour off is just, you know, a gift. But, uh, but it, you know, like they say, if we ever get to go to a bowl game or, uh, you know, even possibly the Rose Bowl, it'll all be worth it. 16! <laughs> It'll all be worth it. Someday, each of these young men will look back and judge that value for himself as he totes up the trade-offs he made to try to succeed at football. The coaches they play for look at their own lives and at what football means to them, and they have no doubts. The very best thing, the opportunity to get my education. I had some not severe academic problems, but I was a borderline academic student at the time coming out of high school. Once I got to school playing football and got my act squared away, I got a chance to do well in school. I got my degree and got a chance to get my master's degree. That's the best thing that football did for me. It gave me a different perspective on life and a chance to, to move and a chance to, to better myself in life. He's up. Come off the face. Come off the face. Hey. Hey, Dennis, take it again. Jim Strong was the first in his family to go to college. His real interest there was in playing football. His father has driven a truck all his life. His mother is an x-ray technician. All Jim ever wanted to do was be a coach. My mother, a lot of people she worked with that were the doctors and the lawyers, uh, successful people, and they had some financial stability. That's, that's what uh, she wanted her son to do. I talked to her about uh, possibly being a teacher or coach someday and having those desires. and. Really got a lot of negative feedback from my mother. You know, we'd ride into, even when I was in junior college and I made up my mind that I wanted to be a coach someday, you know, I'd be riding in and mom would say, but do you know what those school teachers make? <laughs> do you know what those coaches make? And I've been fortunate, you know, I've been able to do that uh, as, as long as I can remember now. And, and coaching has always been something that's given me a happiness and a peace in my heart. And, uh, I've been lucky enough to provide a meal on the table, too, so I guess I can say I've got the best of both worlds. I mean, you run right at them. Growing up the time I did, the late 50s, early 60s, where, you know, we had the butch haircuts and boys were boys and girls were girls type things, where it, it, it really meant a lot at that time, you know, uh, to be a physically tough youngster, especially where I'm from. Uh, I went to high school in Pattison, New Jersey, which, you know, was kind of rough and tumble place a little bit. and. Uh, so it was, it was an expression of, of toughness, I think. Did you get a scholarship to go to college? I did. I had, I had a chance to go to three or four different schools, and I ended up going to Wichita State. And the reason I did was because I wasn't the best student out of high school. I really was a very, very poor student. And uh, thank God they gave me an opportunity to go to school and play football. Uh, so that I feel good about that. Did you become a better student? I did my junior and senior year. I really did. I tell you what happened. I flunked out my first semester at Wichita State. The football coach at that time was a fellow named Hank Fulberg, and they called him the Gator. He was about six foot five, about 250, and had a very bad, rough complexion. He called myself and three other guys in there and said, fellas, you all flunked out. Get your bus tickets, you're on your way home. I said, oh my God, there's no way I can go home. Not that my daddy's gonna, you know, that wasn't the problem, but you know, all the bragging he did at home and, you know, with family expectations and so forth. And the three of us just about broke down and started to cry. And we started walking out there. He says, you all come back here. So he came back. He said, uh, those Fs you've got will be Ds. I don't ever want to see you back in here again. I was never back in there again. I never dreamed that I would be able to play here. You just don't think it's possible. I mean, like, even now I'm here, you know, it's, it's like a dream, really. Why do you suppose that is? Because you're from a small town and a small school? Yeah, probably. Because you're probably, I mean, you're isolated like from them. I mean, they're just, their names and on the radio, the news. And you're, you're on, I mean, you don't associate with these people, I mean, because you never see them. And if you meet them, it's just like, wow, you know. 
<laughs> you put it through it. Yeah. Troy Walkow grew up in a family that loved competing with each other in sports and giving the losers a hard time. Halfway through his first season on a Gopher football scholarship, Troy learned what a real hard time was and quit the team. I think I was, I was putting so much pressure on myself more than anything else. You know, the coaches and the team and, you know, getting ready for games as a freshman, you know, something you've never, person never experiences until you go through it. And I was, you know, sitting there, come on, you know, Troy, let's do it right. And if something didn't go right, I'd really get down. And I got, I don't know, I got sick. And I mean, I felt really sick. And uh, a couple practices, you know, I'm just, you know, why am I here, you know? Because I, I got all A's in high school, and I worked hard to achieve them. But some nights I'd come back from practice, and you just couldn't pick up a book. You know, your head would be ringing or something. And I suppose you got to force yourself to, but I just didn't. And then I do poorly on a test, and I wasn't used to that. Uh, you know, what, what's going on? You know, I mean, I'm not stupid, but look, there's a D, you know? And I, I don't know, I just panicked, probably. What happened when you made that decision to leave the team? Well, I had my family behind me, you know, because, you know, they'd support whatever I wanted. And no one else really knew about it. And I, told, you know, told Coach Holtz, you know, and he wished me the best of luck and all that. And then, I don't know, it was in the paper the next day, and, and people, you know, were shocked, I guess, because I did, you know, I represent Lakeville, supposedly. You know, I come from there, and it's a great town, good school, and I, I suppose they sort of felt let down as a whole, you know. Did you feel those expectations when you first came here? No, I, I don't, I didn't even know it. I mean, all of a sudden I quit, people are telling me there's expectations, you know, you're letting your town down. Well, how did that affect you? It made me feel mad, really, at first. But, you know, then I decided if that's the way it is, you know, that's the way it is. I, I'm doing what's best for me, hopefully, and, and the team, really. After the football season, Troy came back to the team. And in spring practice, he earned what he calls the ultimate reward. First team offensive guard. And what did he learn from his personal struggle? Be sure you talk to people about if you have a problem or something's bothering you, go talk to them because you'll feel a lot better if you go talk to someone than if you sit there by yourself. Do you think that you found the knack for how to practice hard and also get your college work done? Yeah. What is it? Just uh, budgeting your time. I mean, your school's number one, football's number two, social life's number three. You know, you just got to discipline yourself to put it in that order. So the players get the message. Football contains the great lessons of life. Sacrifice now for the long-term gain. If you get knocked down, get up. If you feel pressure, discipline yourself, budget your time, get the job done. The question is, which job? You're here to get an education. First, foremost, is primary. Number one reason for being at the university is to get an education. As many times as the players hear that, they know that football is their job. For much of the school year, they have to spend more time on football than on their studies. Although their schedules make it clear what their real priority is, they're expected to do it all. Why? because football success is what the public demands. There is so much money riding on it from ticket sales and television. Although the university's policy is to deliver the goods, some academic officials are distressed. I am among the very many supporters of the football program at the University of Minnesota, but I am very much concerned about the place of the football player as a student within the university. Gene Lupton is dean of General College at Minnesota, the open enrollment unit most football players enter. Just like a lot of students who are not athletes, many players have had poor preparation in high school and need remedial work to help them make what the NCAA calls reasonable progress toward a degree to stay eligible to play ball. Dean Lupton sees a big improvement in the new football leadership. I have uh, nothing but praise for Coach, Coach Holtz. Uh, he has uh, participated actively. His coaching staff has participated actively with the college uh, through their uh, special academic support program. But the coaches cannot do it all, and the college cannot do it all in a limited period of time to make up some of the deficiencies that do exist. 
It's challenge enough to steer students toward a degree from general college, which is not so demanding as other units of the university. But one year from now, the university will no longer allow general college to grant degrees, and its students will have to do well enough to win admission to other degree-granting units at Minnesota. Dean Lupton is afraid a significant number of players won't be able to earn degrees, and she doesn't want to see them given academic credit for weightlifting, sham courses, or playing their sport the way they are at some Big Ten schools. It is a make-do work, make-do academic work, and make-do academic progress. Uh, I would oppose uh, vehemently, I do oppose vehemently, any kind of special programming that uh, downgrades what is the essential academic achievement uh, and need of the athlete, just as I would oppose it for any other student in the University of Minnesota. We aren't going to sacrifice the academic excellence of the University of Minnesota for an athlete. We haven't done it in the past, nor do we intend to do it in the future. The question is whether the university administration itself will compromise its standards to stay competitive in football. Do alumni contributions go up when the football team wins? Yeah, everything goes up when the football team wins. <laughs> yes, uh, I think the morale of the, of the institution goes up when the team wins. Uh, I think uh, the morale of the alumni uh, goes up. How about the support of the legislature? I think the support of the legislature goes up. I think the public must relate to the fact that these students are highly recruited, especially chosen, uh, uh, separated out from the average run of the student body. Uh, I'm not saying that's good, that's bad, it's just a fact. But it is difficult for a number of them to relate to the fact that because of this special activity related to their uh, position in the University of Minnesota, that somehow or other they won't be taken care of and given the necessary treatment to uh, maintain their eligibility, regardless of whether or not it uh, may or may not affect their uh, work in the classroom. The man talking with players in the Gopher locker room is their academic counselor, Leroy Gardner. Gardner knows what they're going through. He was a scholarship basketball player at the U in the 1960s. He has a master's degree in educational psychology. I asked him about prospects for marginal student athletes trying to get into degree programs out of general college. It's too early to tell. You know, Is we're, it too early to worry? Well, we're worried. I'm worried. Uh, I, and I call it access not to the university, but access to a degree granting program and still maintaining their athletic eligibility. Let's go, defense! Stay D! Because college football has become such a big business, inviting abuses, college presidents recently have taken a stronger hand in shaping NCAA policies. Next year, academic entrance requirements will be tougher. That will affect recruiting, the key ingredient in football success. The system needs these young men. I asked Leroy Gardner whether they know what demands will be made of them. There comes a point in the process that you, I call it the, the moment of betrayal when all of a sudden you realize as a young person, hey, people are making money off of me. And I'm a poor student. Yes, my academic scholarship covers food and tuition, but I ain't got no money. I'm broke. I have nothing in my pocket, okay? Yet there's money being made. That moment of betrayal, some students begin to feel like maybe they are being used, okay? But what I do is t I talk about this. Now, you love athletics. You're getting your scholarship. It's paying for your education. There are many people who don't get your education paid for. You use this opportunity to educate yourself. And if you get your degree, you haven't been misused. You use the system. The system used you. But you still come out with something, and that is your degree. We're to go to the Rose Bowl, and nobody in the country thinks we have a chance but us. That's all that matters. What is it like being in Minnesota, being far away from home? Um, first, it was really tough being um, this far from home because it was the first time I had left my parents, really. And then to come 1,200 miles and, you know, know I'm not, knowing that I won't be able to see them for like four or five months at a time. But, um, you know, I made friends quickly up here, and that helped 
helped me, you know, resolve the problem of being homesick a lot. Ricky Foggy comes from Waterloo, South Carolina, one of nine children. His dad works as a barber, his mom as a seamstress in a clothing plant. When sports writers ask Lou Holtz to name his candidates for All-America, he tells them linebacker Pete Nigerian, quarterback Ricky Foggy. How did you happen to come to the University of Minnesota? Um, I really cannot tell you because it's like um, the day before signing date, I, I had my mind made up to go to North Carolina. And um, just by some happen, I, I just changed my mind at the last moment and took my chance to come up here to the University of Minnesota. Because I knew, because one reason was North Carolina was going to um, give me a chance. They was going to put me at defensive back. And um, Minnesota's going to give me a chance to quarterback. And I think that's what really sold me. Who and told you that you would have a chance to play quarterback? Coach Holtz told me when I came up here on my visit that, w that he would give me the opportunity to play quarterback. And he really seemed like a smart coach when I first met him because he was very bright. And, um, and he was telling me about the offense and, you know, going seeing in my film that he said I might have a possibility of playing and um, you know and then you know he was very nice and kind to my family and I think that was stuck on him from the first time they met him. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to work in a steel mill, I wanted to have a car, I wanted to have five dollars in my pocket and I wanted to have a girl. Other than that I didn't have any desire for anything else. How did you get introduced to football? Well I was always involved in football because during World War II the individual that sort of was my father image was my uncle Lou who participated in high school athletics he was 10 years older than me my grandfather used to take me to the high school football games and my uncle would take me to practices etc and uh, you just sort of grew up around football it was a very prominent sport in the Ohio Valley where I was raised and you just learned to grow up with it and you fell in love with it well I, I like football because uh, it was something that was uh, accepted. Uh, the band played, the crowd was excited, the town got behind it, and I enjoyed it, and it was very, very competitive. I wasn't a particularly good athlete, but the way I got into coaching was that uh, my high school coach came up and told my parents that he thought I ought to go to college and uh, become a football coach. I had no desire to become a football coach. I had no desire to go to college. Nobody from either side of our family had ever gone away to college. How did your own image of what your life would be change from the idea of working in the steel mill to being a football coach? Well, when I was in high school, and I know people find this hard to believe sometimes, I was a dull one. I was a dull one in the group. There were about five or six of us that ran around together. It was from there that I just sort of felt, hey, I wasn't going to do much with my life. Then when I was forced to go to college, I didn't want to go to college, but after the coach told my parents how to go to college, my parents and I reached a compromise that I would go to college, even though I didn't want to. What did they do for a living? Well, my father was a bus driver, and my mother was a housewife. But I did not have a scholarship, so to go to college and for my sister to go to nurse's training, my mother had to go to work as a nurse's aide on the 11 to 7 shift, which was a tremendous sacrifice for her, which bothered me. At night? At night. But I went away to Kent State, and I would go for one year. And I wasn't a good student. Most folks in the town did not feel I could do the work academically. Well, that was a challenge. Challenges have always excited me. So I was going to go to college for one year, prove I could do the work academically, and then return back to East Liverpool, Ohio, to work in the steel mill, which I did. I got very good grades my first year in college. Went back, got a job in the steel mill that summer, was not going to go back to college. Worked as a laborer in the open hearth for five days. On the fifth day, I got the biggest calendar you could find and start marking off the days I could go back to college. I did not know at that time exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew what I did not want to do, and I did not work to work in the steel mills, labor in the open heart the rest of my life. How can you say that when you were running around with those friends when you were 15, 16 years old, that you were dull and not intelligent? Because it was absolutely true. I was exceptionally dull. I didn't have an awful lot of self-confidence. I never had a date till uh, my sophomore year in college. I'm talking about I never went to the prom or anything else. I was much younger than the other people in my class. I was 16 when I graduated. I started to school at age five. Consequently, uh, I was a very immature individual. When everybody else is going to the prom, I'm still playing with trucks, so to speak. Uh, it was at Kent State University when I joined a fraternity. And uh, I only had one bid. And I didn't get that till my sophomore year. I mean, it was just uh, 
blase individual. Once I joined the fraternity, uh, I just started accepting myself for, for what I was. Uh, I had a poor self-image. I didn't have an awful lot of self-confidence. I felt awkward around people. Um, and it went from there. And I know sometimes people find that difficult to believe that I couldn't talk or speak or uh, sort of mumbled, uh, have a bad lisp. Uh, it, it's bad today, but it was horrendous in those days. And uh, it's just, uh, that's a fact. I'm not embarrassed about it. I think that we all have idiosyncrasies of things we have to overcome when we're younger. I wish that I could go back now and understand that the real values of life is not being accepted by your fellow man, but being accepted by yourself. And I didn't understand that then. Accepting yourself means finding out who you are. The fellow talking with Coach Lou Holtz is Tom Seary, a running back who knew very well during high school who he was. Player of the year in the Minneapolis City League, a star at Edison High School, a probable starter at a small college, but not a candidate for a football scholarship at a big university, a Division I school like Minnesota. At 5'7 and 175 pounds, he was considered too small. But Tom Seary could not accept that. So he became what is known in the business of college football as a walk-on. I wanted to play Division I or give it a shot, see if I could. And I don't want to settle for second best, I guess. Where does that come from, Tom? I don't know. Probably my family, I guess. But I was never, never pushed in anything for my family. But they've always supported me. I mean, my parents have never missed a game since I was nine years old in football. Coach, got my hands off. Push it, push it deep. That's it. Drive back. Drive back, drive back. Drive back. Drive back. Tom Seary is the kind of ball player Coach Holtz has a special regard for, an intelligent, intense driver who will not make a mistake that will cost his team a game. After Tom's freshman season, Holtz awarded him a scholarship. But he is still far from being a starter in the gopher backfield. He plays mostly on special teams. It's kind of hard now that, you know, it's different from high school. Because in high school, you're in there all the time. I mean, I came out on extra points. That was my rest for the game. Sometimes you feel that you, you know, they don't need you, you know. I mean, if you're there, you're there. If you're not, you're not. But that's not true. I mean, everybody has a, has a job to do. Not everybody can... You know, be a starter, be an All-American. They need people to do other things. It's, it's rough to be the person that does other things. Sometimes it's really hard. But you just have to accept what, you know, what you can do and try to be the best at it that you can. Tom is so determined that he forced himself to practice this spring even after a painful hamstring pull. An injury to a muscle behind his thigh, an injury that often takes five or six weeks to recover from. But Tom kept trying every other day or so to test it after physical therapy. First thing that an athlete has to be able to do is distinguish the difference between pain and injury. Trying to build a football team in the spring, it's important that that athlete be on the practice field. You know, durability is really a key in an athlete being able to be successful. You know, some guys have ability but they don't have durability, you know, they don't have that consistency day in and day out. And the thing we're trying to find is what an athlete, you know, who can we count on? Tom Steele! Tom, let's go! Even though the coaches say they do not expect a man to play while he's hurt, Tom felt he had to impress them, not only with his ability, but with his desire. As the late coach of the Green Bay Packers, Vince Lombardi, used to say, to succeed, you gotta wanna. The code of football says you must play with pain. Your teammates need you. A few days before the spring game at the Dome, Tom Seary's determination to play did not appear to be enough. You'd have to be determined if you coached football at this level of intensity. My neighbors see me coming home late evening, said, you working again? They, they said, well, what do you do down there all day? I mean, how much time can you devote to football? It's the equivalent of two full-time jobs. They have to recruit players sell them on the idea that Minnesota is a better place than any of the five or 50 or 100 other schools that want them just as much. They have to plan and teach and spend time counseling players off the field. A lot of it is grinding work, like cutting up film of practice sessions, analyzing each player's moves, 
reviewing it with the players, watching each play forward and backward until the lesson sinks in. I don't care what kind of running back you are, you can't play without the football. So I want to do a good job protecting the ball. It's been on the ground over and over and over again this spring, and I don't want to see it happen again today. All right, I want to look at the film right quick. Jim Strong is 30 years old. He would be a head coach at a big university right now if that school didn't think he was too young. Lou Holtz says Strong will be a head coach soon. Getting ahead does not mean less work. It means more work. I look at it as a coach, and sometimes we spend all of our time helping raise someone else's children. The time you stop and think about it from 6 until 9 or 10 at night, when maybe another parent might be at home visiting with their son or daughter or being able to spend some quality time with that individual, uh, that football coach, he's usually going to be at the office getting ready for next week's game. Or if it's not next week's game, he's on the road recruiting. And I think that the families have to be very understanding, and they're the ones that really have to sacrifice because usually the individual involved in the coaching profession, he loves the job that he's doing. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it. Do you like football? I love football. I've always loved football. <laughs> I grew up in Oklahoma. That's all we have, oil and football. <laughs> this is Carrie Strong, Jim's wife. They're expecting their first child in October. Like Jim, Carrie has a commitment to other people's children. She's a psychiatric social worker helping parents of critically ill infants up there on the hill at university hospitals. It's real rewarding. Um, I would say probably one aspect that I look forward to the most is the follow-up clinic because you get to see the children after they've grown up from being premature or whatever, four months, six months, a year later, and you get to see how they've progressed and how they've grown and, and the joy that that brings to a parent. Carrie supports Jim's football career, even when he's between jobs. He started as an assistant under Lou Holtz at Arkansas, and when Holtz left there, Jim and Carrie had no idea where they'd land. Did she know what she was letting herself in for when she married a football coach? We dated for almost two years, and it was real important to him, and I didn't see it at that time, how important it was for me to go through a complete season, you know, seeing the recruiting and then the season, and then going back into recruiting again. And um, I really see how important that is now, to know the time and the investment that it takes. And did they know what they were letting themselves in for when they moved to Minnesota? We drove up here on a Sunday, and it was either March the 3rd or 4th into a blizzard, and I thought, oh, Lord, what have you brought us to <laughs> all this snow? I just want to put in a plug for this hotel. It's the first time in 15 months that I've been in the state of Minnesota that I've been warm. <laughs> so <laughs> that's always encouraging. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here and visit with the Goal Line Club. Goal Line Club members provide the Gopher football team with summer jobs. Any member who fails to meet his quota loses his preferred seating at the Dome. Lou Holtz carries on a constant crusade. He never misses an opportunity to sell Minnesota football. Seven times we're going to be on national TV. My son said to me, he's a freshman at the University of Minnesota, he said, gee, Daddy, he said, we're going to become America's team. <laughs> A lot of coaches can coach, and they don't have any personality. They're not motivators. They can't sell. They don't win. This guy's got it all. I've never seen a guy who can do the things he can do. He's a whirling dervish. This is a clinic Holtz and his staff put on for more than 900 high school coaches from all over this region. It helps the visitors. It doesn't hurt go for recruiting. We visit a major college every spring, and. Uh, for the past, I don't know how many years, maybe 15 or 16 years, we've been as far as Tennessee and Notre Dame, Nebraska, Michigan, Iowa, of course, and the close schools. But now uh, we feel that uh, it's not being done better anywhere in America than right here. Once we sell this stadium out on season tickets, ladies and gentlemen, you won't see anything turn the program around any quicker than a demand and a need to get in the stadium. So you're going to say, why is a sellout important? Sellout is important for an awful lot of reasons. And let me start with number one, it helps you win. It helps you win because it attracts good athletes in recruiting. They have recruited the best football class that I think Minnesota has had in a long time. On paper, Gary, you never know until they play. 
And I'll tell you my opinion. I've, I have such high, high regard for him that it's my opinion, maybe I'm crazy, that if they keep Ricky Foggy healthy, <clears throat> they could win the Big Ten Championship. <clears throat> I think Ricky Foggy is probably the best option quarterback in the country. He might be the best athlete to ever play at the University of Minnesota. Now, that's a great statement to make. This guy is that good. Their target is to go to a bowl game this year. And uh, if I had a dollar and it was the last dollar and I had to bet it, then I would bet that dollar that the University of Minnesota will be playing in a bowl game this year. Harvey McKay has a dollar, all right, and it is not his last. He is the town's number one booster, orchestrator of the Twins ticket buyout, former Minnesota varsity golfer, successful businessman, and one of the prime movers in luring Lou Holtz to Minnesota. Had a plan, a game plan, where uh, we had to meet the key uh, business leaders in the community, and I just made all kinds of representations about what kind of community it is. For example, which he was just uh, thunderstruck by, we have 46 New York Stock Exchange firms right here in the state of Minnesota. So we tried to tell Coach Holtz that he had an unusual opportunity not to sell a student athlete on four years, but 40 years. They could come here and they could make their living here. And now they're talking about winning. They're getting to the point where they expect to win. Their work habits, their ethics, all of it comes along with, hey, having a big time program. But to me, if we're really gonna make this the best place in the country, we're gonna do it through the grassroots. What we want to do is we want to get a club in every single town in this entire state, $25 to join it. And that guy gives $25, all of a sudden he's going to follow you. He's going to care. He's the guy who's going to buy tickets. He's the guy who's going to wear the shirt. He's the guy who's going to wave the pennant. We've got to go to the grassroots, and we've got to go through this entire state. They threw the die away when they made Lou Holtz. I think he's a magnificent leader. He's a beautiful person. And I think in a short span of time, he has done more for the state of Minnesota, not just football, but just for pride, from a pride standpoint. I think in a short span of time, he's done more than the Humphreys and the Mondales, with all respect to them, which took them a lifetime. He's done that in 16 months. And so Minnesota's drive for football success has produced a new field house, a $5 million showcase to attract the kind of athletes it takes to win. At a spring practice meeting leading up to the intra-squad game at the Dome, Coach Holtz asks several new players who have just joined the team from junior colleges and as freshmen to stand up and introduce themselves. Speak up, son. You're what? Sean Callahan. Sean Callahan. Where are you from, Sean? Uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. La Crosse, Wisconsin. The best thing that ever came out of there was an empty bus. Okay. <laughs> Okay, man, make everybody feel at home. I want to see uh, Randy Pelfrey. Everybody else, let's call. Coach, you missed a couple. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you, you, you are standing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, Randy, you know, name is Marty Worden. I'm from Winona. I went to Golden Valley Lutheran College. And you're first semester here. How tall are you? About five eight. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> this program is based on honesty. <laughs> What, five, three, five, four? <laughs> Seriously, how tall are you? What? How tall are you? I said five eight on my physical. <laughs> <laughs> your feet reach your ground? <laughs> they do, you're big enough to play here at Minnesota. At the spring game, Holtz will not coach. He will bounce back and forth between radio and television, commenting on the play and selling direct. Coaching the St. Paul team will be defensive coordinator John Gutekunst. Coaching Minneapolis, offensive coordinator Larry Beckish. When they chose up sides, Gutekunst took quarterback Ricky Foggy. Beckish has a game plan. We've got several things going that's going to kind of even the game up. One is I understand Ricky Foggy's going to be arrested Friday night. For? for well, there's a couple jerseys missing in the locker room. <laughs> In the spring game, the players will compete with each other for starting positions on the team. The losing team members, including coaches, each must perform several hours of community service. Uh, the stakes are high. I already know where I'm going to do my community work if you guys don't play well. What's riding on this game Saturday night? My pride. Larry Beckish, the son of a New Jersey state trooper. John Gutekunst, 
the son of a Pennsylvania teacher and coach. These men love spending their lives with young people. For assistant coaches in big time college football, they have reached the pinnacle. But they both say they would be happy coaching anywhere. I was out of football coaching for 14 months. We had lost our jobs at Clemson. We had, a, we had what we thought was a great football team. In fact, after we got fired, the next two years, Clemson went to the Gator Bowl and eventually won a national championship with the youngsters that, that we had recruited. So I walked away from football for about 14 months. It about cost me my family and about cost me my sanity. I, had, I missed it that much. Uh, every Saturday, every Sunday during football season was, was truly an agony that, that first year I was out. I was finding fault with people as far as when I watch a game on television or I went to see a college game, I was, I was so critical. I wasn't, I wasn't, people didn't want to be around me because all I did was criticize the coaches, the players and so forth because I guess it was my defense mechanism that, that was coming up because I had missed the game as much as I did. And uh, I decided at that time, I was working, believe it or not, with a construction company. I was 36 years old, repairing bridges. Didn't know what I was gonna do. And one day I said to myself, I'm getting back in football, whether it's junior high, high school, whatever it is, but I'm going back to football. And when I came back, I had a completely different attitude than I did previously. And the, the big change in my attitude was, where before we got fired at Clemson, uh, I was always kind of looking over my shoulder, when, when's the ass going to fall type thing. You know? and, and when I came back, I made a promise to myself that I'd work as hard as I could, do the very best I could, and let the chips fall where they may. And football has been even that much more of a joy now. In the town I came from, Pennsylvania, Gary, a uh, town of about 2,300 people. There was a neighboring town, maybe 4,800 people. Everything else was um, dairy farm, truck farm area, but it was Pennsylvania. I never played in front of a high school crowd of less than 5,000 people, so when uh, when we were growing up, uh, you know, that's what you look forward to. That was more important than uh, a Penn State uh, team, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, or uh, whatever. It's similar to uh, a place like Stillwater here. Uh, you know, it's important to get the on that Stillwater team, and that's, that's the way I grew up, but also my dad happened to be a football coach and a football player. Did you play for him? No, never did. I played uh, one year of junior high basketball for him. In fact, it's the only coach that's ever thrown me off a team. <laughs> that's good. John Gutekunst played his college football at Duke in North Carolina, then stayed on as an assistant coach for 12 years, too long, he says, for anyone who wanted to become a highly successful head coach someday. But he was more devoted to his family than to that kind of success. What do you love about football? Game day. Yeah. I don't like football practice. Never did as a player, still don't as a coach. But I like losing a lot less. Uh, get off the ground, don't lay on the ground, don't lay on the ground. Get up and jog, get up and jog. I'm nervous away from from kickoff time. I'm nervous until I'm in the locker room and the players come there because I enjoy seeing a young man go out there and execute. And the, the other thing about sports that I like is that you're in a time-restricted area. Uh, I don't have a year to teach a young man in many cases. If, if I know I'm gonna put him on the field, I've gotta prepare him that week for that test and he, he has to produce in that situation. Not necessarily always for my own good, but for his. St. Paul, you got a one in. Shut him out, let's shut him out. I had a dream, 48 zip. I had a dream. Talk to you about the things we want. Let's put on a good show, show them we're first class. No walking on the field, no foolish penalties, and I don't want to see a cheap shot. Now, we're playing our own teammates, but by God, we're going out there to win. On and we're going to bust them. Defense, get shoe to shoe and knock the pee out of them. Offense, hit your landmarks, keep your feet moving, let the backs with their skill do the job. You play like we got to win right now. We're four and seven last year. We made a lot of good things, but that ain't winning, is it? No, no sir. All right. Let's show them tonight what winning's all about. Effort, praise your teammates, help everybody up. No walking on the field. And have a hell of a lot of fun playing football. Let's go, baby. 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 Let's go
Stay home. You know, football is one of those games where everybody wears helmets, and uh, it's very easy to sit there and compare them to the pros. And oh, you know, sit in the stands and uh, uh, why'd he miss that tackle? Why'd he drop that pass? And those sort of things. There's no identification with that. Hey, that is a young man trying to do the best he can. But as a coach, they're all young men. We were all in that situation. We all made mistakes. We still make mistakes. I enjoy letting the game get into their hands. Go, you go first. Ball is on the 32-yard line of Team Minneapolis. It is second down and six. Gain of four in the last one. Foggy. Play action. Makes his time. He has a lot of protection. Wide open. Touchdown. Marty Warden, number three, five, eight. But that doesn't matter. He was wide open. A 33-yard touchdown pass. Ricky Foggy to Marty Worden. You remember Marty Worden, the transfer from Golden Valley Lutheran. His feet may have touched the ground in practice, but on this night at the Dome, he was walking on air. And obviously, Larry Beckish failed to have Ricky Foggy arrested. Here you see a replay of it. Great protection, though. Ricky stands in there, finds Marty Worden, a young man that just came out this year, a non-scholarship player, junior college player, walked on. But Ricky's arm is so much stronger, his poise is so much better, and Ricky is really a fine passer. Do not be mistaken. Ricky can throw the ball. No matter how many times you run it back, the guy's still open. Plays are wonderful. It just, uh, you know, especially you can't lose tonight, coach. There's no way this man can lose this game. The important thing is that the state of Minnesota can't lose. So it was a good night for a new face named Marty Worden, and a good night for number 26, Tom Seary, who managed to play without aggravating his injured leg, and he earned the notice of Gopher athletic director Paul Geel on television. Oh, he's a gutty little guy. I'll tell you what, catching the pass, running the ball, a walk-on, so pleased to see him get a scholarship. And it was a good night for the St. Paul team because Ricky Foggy did what he has been taught to do and more. Thought he saw a hole, got through the hole and still pitched it out. That's out. Down the right sideline, 20, 10. Chalk it up, six points. Touchdown. How many good nights will the Gophers enjoy this fall? That's one question among many this look inside football raises. But there are deeper questions. Lou Holtz tells everybody you can approach life asking three questions. Can I trust you? Are you committed to excellence? And do you care about the people around you? Here's one more question to ponder. If football can teach us about life, what can life teach us about football? Meanwhile, everybody up for the kickoff. Number one, it's kind of nice to be around winners. I like to be around winners, and I think Lou Holtz is the winner. I was a starting D tackle in Michigan Stadium last year as a freshman in front of 106,000 people. And how many people get to do that? When I really think about it, you know, I try not to take it for granted. Thank God every day that, uh, that I get an opportunity to do this. When you have winning teams, it's easy to cover. When you have losing teams, it isn't any fun. Uh, there just isn't anything to write about. I have enjoyed it. It's been an awful good profession. It's been a rewarding profession, but I think there's more to life than just an outcome of a football game. This program was a production of KTCA-TV, Channel 2. KTCA would very much like to have your comments in our production, Rose Bowl or Bust. If you have comments, please call 642-1980. That's 642-1980. And thanks from Channel 2. Tonight's broadcast schedule is brought to you in part by Deluxe Check Printers Incorporated. The Medtronic Foundation. TKDA, Tolts King, Duvall, Anderson, and Associates Incorporated, engineers, architects, and planners. The people at Science...